A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, bismillahi r-rahman ar-rahim. Ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahduhu la sharika lahu. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu amma ba'd. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, bismillahi r-rahman ar-rahim. Brothers and sisters, before getting into the specifics of this talk today about social justice in Islam, I like us at the outset <clears throat> to ourselves to make dua for those victims of womb throughout the world. Pray for the members of this ummah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will relieve our suffering and bring our actions closer to his pleasure. Let us remember there's so many areas where folks are suffering, but let us remember our brothers and sisters in Philistine who perhaps permanently, but more than likely, just had a delay in having even more of their land occupied by the occupying force of the Israeli government. Let us pray for the stateless Rohingya, who for the last few years have been deprived of citizenship of a land where they have been for centuries, have been kicked so many of them out of their own country have had to flee and those remaining behind have been tortured and killed. Those getting out of the country find themselves in refugee camps. Let us remember our Uyghur and other Chinese Muslims as they battle against the state of China, not the physical battle but they battle to maintain their very lives and their existence and the existence of Islam that has been there for so many centuries in this area known as China. Let us pray and make dua for our brothers and sisters in Yemen who are experiencing perhaps one of the greatest humanitarian crises on earth at this time because of a continued bombing that this nation, this tiny nation, has suffered from, where starvation has become, unfortunately, a way of life in that land. Brothers and sisters, there are so many areas that we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mercy for and to relieve the suffering. But let us not forget those who are suffering in this country. Remember those who are trapped in substandard housing in the inner cities. Remember those who are living in these conditions, in substandard conditions, living in food deserts and find themselves unable to purchase nutritional food because of their lack of access to food that would benefit their bodies and provide nutrition so that they could stay healthy. Remember those who are living literally in zip codes of death, that they are living in zip codes that where people are housed would have the highest number of deaths, deaths before COVID-19 even. I'm talking about from nutritionally uh, based diseases like diabetes and hypertension and other diseases that in certain zip codes across this country, there's an inordinate number of people dying on a day-to-day -day basis because they are trapped without any, oftentimes of any choice of their own because of finances and other reasons they are trapped in these death-coded uh, zip codes. Remember our rural uh, American brothers and sisters, who oftentimes represent the invisible poor in this country. They are far away from the, the sites, the centers of media. So oftentimes when we look into rural America, we don't see the suffering that they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't see the greedy corporations who find their areas because of a lack of political organization and the space that people are from one another. They find these as very opportune places to dump toxic waste. Let us pray for those who are victims of environmental racism, but also 
victims because their political stature is such or is perceived as such in this nation that they are not going to raise too much of a hue and cry in this country. Pray for our uh, fellow human beings across this nation who are living in housing that has no plumbing, in housing that has no indoor toilets. There are over 140 million people in the United States today who are suffering from poverty, who are below the government established poverty level in the United States. And that these people oftentimes are suffering in silence. And that we, you and I, as Muslims, have a duty and responsibility to, if we don't know about their existence, to find out about their existence. Because we've been mandated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to attend to the needs of the poor, of the miskeen, to attend to the needs of those who are being oppressed in this society. There are 41 million people suffering from near starvation every single day in the United States of America that we like to recognize as being the richest land in the world, but it's also a land that wastes more food than any country on the planet while we have over 41 million Americans suffering from near starvation on a day-to-day -day basis. Remember in our dua, let's ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help those who are incarcerated in this country. This nation, the United States, incarcerates more individuals than any country in the world, not per capita but there are almost 2.5 million people incarcerated in the United States leads the world in this number of their own citizens being locked up. The overwhelming majority in a disproportionate percentage are those who are African American, those who are Latino, the harshest sentences for the same crimes are meted out to African Americans and Latinos in this country and the devastating effect and impact that this practice in this country has had on these uh, American citizens is something that we would have to discuss uh, at a later date. Brothers and sisters, In closing on this portion of this talk, let us remember the over 600,000 people and an ever-growing number in America today who are homeless, who many are sleeping with their families in cars if they're fortunate enough to even own a car because of COVID-19 and because of the economic devastation, the number of layoffs, the number of firings that have come about in the last few months in this country because of COVID-19, the homeless population is steadily increasing without the infrastructure to absorb these ever increasing numbers. So more and more of Amer American families find themselves sleeping in shelters or sleeping in woods or sleeping in their cars. So let us remember these populations in how to do our today. Let us recognize that the issue of social justice in this country is not a theoretical or abstract issue. When we talk about social justice, and when we talk about social justice in Islam, we have to recognize, we have to know the actual conditions of the people in this country, those that we may come in contact with and personally, and those that we may never 
actually come in contact with. But as Muslims, we have the responsibility as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to us, that you and I have this responsibility to seek these people out. That part, and we'll get into it more, but a portion, a major portion of our responsibility as Muslims and how Islam has defined social justice in the Quran, in the words of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the actions of the prophets before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in those who have come after the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who are a part of this ummah, who have demonstrated so clearly what it means for us to uh, be uh, those who are practicing justice, those who are going to be a part of the effort to bring about social justice uh, in this country. Brothers and sisters, um, I want to just spend a few moments talking about this time that we are actually living in today, that you and I know that the moment, the time that we're living in is a time that is dominated by discussions about the lawlessness, the extrajudicial killings, the brutality of policemen all across this country. And I want to just quickly remind us that it should come as no surprise when we recognize that many of the institutions that this nation is operating under right now, like police, that they had their origin in this country in, uh, in, in elements of oppression, like the police departments in, across the United States originated from the introduction of slave patrols starting in the state of South, South Carolina in the early 1700s, that these slave patrols were charged with the responsibility of, of catching those enslaved Africans and then subsequently African Americans catching them after they had escaped from their condition of enslavement. And so from that uh, genesis, from that beginning, the model for modern day policing in the United States started from that. And so when we see behavior like Derek Carthen, who stayed on the neck with his knee of George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds, despite Mr. Floyd's pleading with him to stop, despite those standing around witnessing what was going on, pleading with this cop to get off this man's neck because you're going to kill him, that he can't breathe. He continued until a lifeless body was in front of him. But it's no surprise when we look at the origin of policing in this country, we shouldn't be surprised. But this moment has been dominated, this period of time in the United States has been dominated by acts, uh, police acts, illegal acts that have happened against Mr. George Floyd. What happened against Breonna Taylor, a woman who was in her house, in her bed, a police, the police come in, knock her door down, and shoot and kill this woman, this African-American woman in her own house. She was an EMT, an emergency medical worker. And this, and, and what we find is that the police came into the house and shot her dead. We're talking about Rashad Brooks, who was asleep in a car, in a drive-through in a Wendy's in Atlanta, Georgia. And in the ensuing process of police intervention, he is shot dead by police officers in the parking lot while he is running away from the police. 
with a taser that had been discharged twice already, police, all police know that it could only be shot twice without having been recharged. And so these are just the tip of the iceberg. The, there are so many more who have died and have been brutalized at the hands of policemen in this country. So now with, with, with outcries, with protests all across the nation, all across the world that have gone on now for over a month, the murder of George Floyd ironically took place on Memorial Day in this country, a time on May the 25th when the nation pauses to recognize those who had died in the service of their country in the military on this day was the day that George Floyd was murdered by a police officer, officer, officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So now the discussion, now the pleas and demands have gone from just a discussion about police brutality and extrajudicial killings to the broader discussion about structural and systemic racism that has been a part of the American mandate for people of color and particularly black people in this, in this country since its inception. You know, it's very interesting. And it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will that we have this discussion on a day that has been designated and celebrated nationally as Independence Day in the United States. That this is a day, although July the 4th, is tomorrow, this is the day of a national celebration in this country, recognizing America's independence from the British. It's a, recognizing a time when the Second Continental Congress, before the organization of the Congress we have today, of the US House of Representatives, the bicameral legislature that we have today, of the Senate and the House of Representatives, that, that this body that was the legislative body for these 13 original colonies on July the 4th, 1776, they endorsed a document that was written by the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. And in this document, if you take the chance to read it, you will hear some of the most profound articulation of the rights of human beings to be free. But yet we find that the author of this Declaration of Independence, and even throughout his life as two terms as a United States president, I'm speaking of Thomas Jefferson, that in spite of whatever personal abstract feelings that he had about the institution of chattel slavery in this country, up until the time that he expired, transitioned, Thomas Jefferson held uh, enslaved people on his plantation called Monticello. Thomas Jefferson was aware, not just about uh, enslaved Africans on his plantation and throughout the South and throughout other parts of the country, but he was also aware of the presence of Muslims who were enslaved in the United States. Let me just give you this little bit of history and I'll move forward. In 1807, the third president of the United States received two manuscripts in Arabic, in the Arabic language. These manuscripts were written by enslaved Muslims who had escaped from plantations, believed to be in Mississippi, had followed the Mississippi River, had gotten uh, uh, to the middle of the country, and in Kentucky, started to travel east following the Cumberland River. And in 1807, two documents 
were de hand delivered to the president of the United States explaining their plight, but more importantly for us as Muslims, more importantly, they were actually quoting ayahs from the Quran and quoting ayahs from surahs that talked about how only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of mankind, not other human beings. So this third president, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, one of the co-writers of the constitution of this nation, was well aware of the existence of not just enslaved Africans as he had them on his own plantation, but he was aware of the presence of Muslims who he had more intimate knowledge about than many of those political leaders preceding him or succeeding him because of his intellectual curiosity and because of the interaction that as president he had to uh, deal with, uh, with people identified as Barbary pirates, the Muslims who were uh, getting uh, uh, an imposed tax from merchant ships from any country going uh, in near their territorial waters in North Africa, they were extracting this tax. And Jefferson was trying to negotiate safe passage for American vessels. So Thomas Jefferson was well aware. But yet we find in written into the Constitution itself, we have encased in this Constitution what we find as a uh, enshrining of white supremacy and what we find being cemented into the words of the Constitution about structural racism. For those who are not familiar with this document, let me just point up a few things and then I'll get back to this issue specifically about social justice in Islam. But what we find in the United States Constitution in the very writing of this document, we find that citizenship was based, was a racial based citizenship. It was not for everyone who was, uh, happened to be born or living in this country. It was a racial citizenship. It meant that those uh, millions, and there were over 10 million kidnapped Africans who were brought across the Atlantic Ocean to labor for close to 400 years, even before the foundation of this, the, the establishment of this nation, to labor for over 400 years without any kind of uh, rep, rep, uh, recompense, that no one was being paid for the labor. So what you have is a racial based citizenship saying that if you are descendants of African people, you are not a citizen of the United States. As a matter of fact, what was written into the constitution that for the purpose of voting and apportioning how many members of the House of Representatives that one would have, that African people would be counted on these plantations as three fifths of a human being. This was to please the planners, the Southern planners, to increase their influence in the halls of Congress of the United States of America. And so this three fifths was written into the US Constitution. The right to vote was not afforded to our citizenship, afforded to the indigenous people of this land, to the Native Americans. The right to vote was not afforded to people of African descent. The right to vote was not even afforded at that time to all white people in this country. The right to vote was based on having property. You had to be a, a property owner and white. And on top of that, you had to be male, property owner and white. That's writ was written into the United States Constitution. So the very, the point that I make is that the very foundation that the country was based on 
was a foundation that excluded a tremendously large portion of the the uh, residents of the citizen well not citizens but the residents of this country and it had particular uh, disallowance for certain freedoms for those of African descent in this country who found themselves enslaved and also for those who were a part of an indigenous population that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how long the uh, Native Americans were living in this part of the world prior to Europeans coming across the Atlantic Ocean and settling in this area called North America and more specifically in the United States. So citizenship was based on race, citizenship was based on owning property, citizenship with the foundation of this nation was rooted and based in systemic structural racism. It was based on a race-based citizenship. And many of the issues as it relates to uh, people, non-white people in this country, and particularly to black folks in this country, have resulted from the foundation that this nation was built upon. Now, I'm going to pause at this moment. There is a very short video uh, that was put together by ICNA Council for Social Justice. Uh, and at this point, we'll just pause for a few moments and watch this maybe two and a half minute video. And inshallah, uh, I will return to finish uh, this discussion with an emphasis on social justice, justice specifically in Islam and our duty and responsibilities as Muslims, not just in our lands of origin where we were born or where our parents were born, but right here, right now in the United States of America. So stay with us, please, and we'll come right back after this video. Inshallah. In order to bring about positive change, we must educate the public on the numerous injustices that are rampant in our society. At the Islamic Circle of North America's Council for Social Justice, or ICNA CSJ, we strongly believe that education leads to awareness, which in turn leads to change. From our 15 chapters across North America, we strive to systematically facilitate assertive Muslim involvement in the field of human struggle for the rights of the poor and oppressed in the United States. We have seven focus areas, family breakdown, structural racism, global injustice, issues of hunger, poverty, and inequality, injustice to indigenous people, Islamophobia, and unjust immigration policies. We currently have a number of active projects running. The Stop School Bullying Initiative was started as a response to Muslim children experiencing bullying in the school system. Working with researchers, we have created anti-bullying workshops and a number of other online resources that students, parents, and teachers can use to educate and take action. The crisis in Kashmir has seen more than 100,000 people killed, among other human rights atrocities. We are working tirelessly to bring awareness to the situation through rallies, social media, and urging U.S. elected officials and the Senate to take action. Through our Muslim Prisoner Support Project, we ensure that Muslim inmates are given full rights and are treated in a civil manner, whilst also providing them access to prayer services and Islamic education. ICNA CSJ is a key player in facilitating the annual National Muslim Advocacy Day in Washington, D.C. This important initiative ensures that issues that affect American Muslim communities and our society in general are discussed and progressed through dialogue with local and federal governments. ICNA CSJ is a nonprofit organization that relies on donations from the public. None of this would be possible without your continuous generous support. We urge you to please donate so that we can continue to advocate for social justice and bring about positive change to the U.S. 
and beyond. Alhamdulillah. Um, welcome back. Um, we show this particular little clip because it's an attempt on the part of the Islamic Circle in North America through ICNA CSJ to actualize, to address real issues and it, real problems confronting the nation of America and confronting <clears throat> Muslims in this country. It's not enough for us to remain abstract when we talk about the poor. We need to see who are these 140 million people in this country who are poor. We need to understand what this, the impact, the generational impact that these kinds of conditions, these imposed conditions, these deaf code, zip code areas in our country that they are not just happenstance that many of these communities in which people are trapped are a result of planned community, just like gated and planned communities in suburban America. When we do our research, we find that these ghettos, that these inner city, these urban uh, death traps by many estimations across the country, that they are by design, uh, that something called redlining in terms of where uh, even people who have the resources to live in certain communities, how real estate agents and the insurance brokers and others uh, follow an unwritten guideline which is referred and has been referred to as redlining to keep people out of certain areas, to keep people out of certain neighborhoods. And then if certain people are allowed in suburban neighborhoods, their numbers would not be a critical mass to cause the majority of the, those communities uh, to be uh, of eth ethnic, uh, particularly to be African-American or to be Latino. And so ICNA, Council for Social Justice, is trying to systematically, and, and we can't take on everything at one time. There's so many issues that need to be addressed. But it's a small attempt, and it's an evolving attempt to actualize our involvement in the life of the Muslim community and the general community as it relates to not just feeding and trying to help house, but trying to advocate, to organize, to become activists on behalf of those who are suffering from them, from organized oppressive systems uh, in this country. I want to just share uh, something, and, and I, I promise that I'm gonna talk specifically about what we as Muslims can do and some textual uh, background as to how we are mandated to address the issue of social justice, no matter where we're living, no matter who that social justice may impact, uh, who, no matter whose feelings may be hurt. We would never try to deliberately disparage anyone's character or their nature. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called upon us to speak a word, and the Prophet ﷺ, to speak a word of truth to power, to take a stand and to be standard bearers for justice in the societies in which we live, regardless of who may be or feel that they're negatively impacted. Meaning, if taking a stand for justice means that I am going to be deprived of something material or social, then I'm obligated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take that stand. If my loved ones, if my relatives, whether it's against people who are rich or poor, this is a mandate from the Lord of the universe. And there's nothing in the Quran, it's nothing in the prophetic tradition of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that exempts our calling to task American government and those American citizens 
who have created and who continue to create institutions and means to just strangle the life and just wring like a wet rag the life and the spirit out of the people because of oppressive institutions that were set up. On the day <clears throat> recognizing the independence of the United States and those 13 original colonies, one of the greatest orators in the history of this nation was called upon to give a speech, a big, big public lecture. And we're talking about in 1852. And I want to mention that the abolitionists, because slavery in this country, in ch uh, chattel slavery, was an institution that was still going strong in this nation in 1852. But one of the most renowned orators and abolitions, abolitionists created in this country was a man by the name of Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass was appealed to to make this speech on the occasion of July the 4th. But people, the abolitionists, and Black people in particular who were speaking against the institution of slavery refused to make a speech or a lecture on July the 4th. So following this particular tradition, Frederick Douglass's most famous, one of his most famous lectures was given on July the 5th because abolitionists and black folks said that, you know, there's something about this July 4th Independence Day that's not setting right with me. We are still enslaved by other people. So we can't celebrate in the way that you celebrate. So on July the 5th, 1852, Frederick Douglass made a speech that was, uh, was, was titled, What to the Slave is the 4th of July. It's a very lengthy lecture. So I'll just reference a very tiny fraction of this uh, very momentous and eloquent speech. If you get the time, go to Sheck Google, look at Sheck Google and you'll see that, uh, and read the speech and you'll see that this man was a, a brilliant wordsmith. And he wasn't just a talker. He was someone who, who put his life uh, on the line for the, for the freedom of enslaved people in this country. And in this uh, lecture, this famous lecture, he was saying to the white community that this 4th of July is yours. It's not mine. You may rejoice, but I must mourn. This man, Frederick Douglass, in these few words capsulize the ambivalence that those folks who had suffered from nothing but discrimination and torture, had suffered nothing but the destruction of their culture, their being stripped of their faith, being deprived even to speak their language, to have their families divided up. The mothers have babies torn from her arms after the child is born to be placed on some plantation uh, to be raised by someone else to be an enslaved person from the beginning until they die. And if they, got, if they had children, then their children would be born into this condition of enslavement. So Frederick Douglass, very eloquently express that, wait a minute, why are you even asking me, someone who had to escape the institution of slavery in Maryland, why are you asking me to talk about Independence Day when I'm just a few years removed from being someone else's property? Now keep in mind, that there's never been a period in the United States history when people of African descent have not fought in the wars of this nation, whether we're talking about the Revolutionary War, 
whether we're talking about African American non Muslims, but it's documented as well that there were Muslims who fought in the Revolutionary War, in the Civil War, and all of the wars of this nation, African American people have fought in these wars despite the ambivalence that we have justifiably had about our treatment in this nation, how it was legal on all of the federal legislation in most of the legislation in the states across the country before 1963, I mean, I'm sorry, 1863, that it was legal to own people of African descent, to work them to death, to treat them in any manner that you desire because they are your property. But yet, there have been African Americans and there have been Muslims of African descent who have fought in every war, every physical encounter that this nation has fought in spite of that ambivalence. And so the responsibility that we have as Muslims in this nation today is not to, in the area of social justice, it should not be to bemoan the fact that the descendants of folks who've gone through a unique experience in human history, that they are not ready to just say, well, that was in the past when there's such an ongoing acts of discrimination happening on a day-to-day -day basis against people of African descent. So what role do we have as Muslims, right? I want to ask that question, starting with myself and with every Muslim who's hearing these words today on this legal holiday of Independence Day for the United States of America. What does this day mean to us when we look at and reflect upon those uh, classes of people that I mentioned before earlier, the statistics, some of the, act, the, the, the victims of organized Zoom, organized oppression in this country, what should this day of independence mean to us? I'm not good in math, so I can't uh, in my head figure out how many years it is, but we're talking about Frederick Douglass making this speech in 1852. And I don't want to embarrass myself and not having calculated with my uh, calculate on my, my smartphone, I don't want to embarrass myself and give a number and my arithmetic is not correct. But up from the time of this 1852 speech until today, the systems of oppression have not changed in this nation. They have just taken perhaps a different form. And so what should this mean to us as so many of us have remained silent in the face of these kinds of acts of oppression against people of color and black people in particular in this country. What justification can you and I have to feel good about saying that we're following the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in saying that Islam has the solution for every possible problem that we will address as individuals or as a collective. What good is that for me to say that when I'm not following one of the most basic sunnahs of the Prophet Muhammad and that is taking a stand against injustice, trying to stop it with our hands or speaking out against it or not being complicit by not hating it in our heart. Don't be silent partners to oppression in this country because this is not consistent with the role that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
has defined for us as Muslims in any society in which we find ourselves, including the United States, to be those standard bearers for justice, to speak out against uh, a womb, against evil, against wrongdoing. That is our divinely mandated responsibility. It's not like some political, just a non-believing political activist, that they are doing what they're doing out of sense of personal justice. No, we have a divinely mandated responsibility to take a position, to take organized positions, to not knowingly or unknowingly in the matter of convenience. I don't want to jeopardize the lifestyle that I have. I don't want to inconvenience myself or my family for taking a stance against wrong in the society when so many people are not saying or doing anything about it. This, in my humble estimation, is not Islam. It's not justifiable. So what should we be doing as Muslims, each and every one of us? We have to educate ourselves about the true history of this nation. We cannot just go to civics books or look into the books that our children bring home from school and say and accept this version of American history, that this is what America has been all about. No, I'm not sitting here today saying that there are not some very uh, good elements in the United States in its documents where there's some very good, high sounding, acceptable, uh, very beautiful words in its founding documents and in other legislation. But what I am saying is that we have to have discernment as Muslims, regardless of whether or not we will personally find ourselves either ostracized or find ourselves losing favor on our jobs. Maybe we won't get that next promotion because of a position that we're taking. I'm not talking about going into the workplace and preaching to the people. But what I'm talking about is that it's our duty and responsibility in whatever small or uh, relatively large way that we can to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem that the times demand, unlike any times in the last maybe 30, 40 years, the times demand that we as Muslims be silent no more. That for whatever reason we haven't spoken out, for whatever reason we haven't joined with others to address these issues that are so devastating to large segments of our society that we are a part of. I just remind myself and remind my Muslim brothers and sisters that part of our citizenship duty is to try to make this country a better nation. It's not something that is just uh, that we should do if we get around to it, that we are mandated through the Quran and through the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad uh, to take and try to do everything that we can to make this country or wherever we live a nation that is better, that reaches out to all of its citizens. If it is not doing that, if it means and I'm not trying to say for people to jeopardize today their jobs by taking positions. Maybe you work with a corporation that has a history and is known to exploit its workers financially with not providing a living wage. Let me digress just for one second. You know, the majority of people who are now designated as essential workers in the United States because of COVID-19 are African-American and of 
excuse me, of Latino descent. Who would have thought that before this COVID-19, that your grocery store workers, that your fast food workers, that people working in restaurants would be classified uh, working in poultry plants, working in slaughterhouses. Who would have thought before this virus that that working population that is so segmented by people of African descent and Latinos would have this wonderful classification as essential workers. So let's take this a step further as Muslims. Let's be a part of demanding for a living wage in this country. Let's be a part of demanding the end of redlining, restricting where people can purchase houses or rent houses, uh, uh, put, get insurance uh, for these houses. Let us as Muslims in this moment of time in which we live today, let us remain silent no more and take a stand and position and say, we want to rid this nation of these deaf zip codes where people who are living in these zip codes are uh, more inclined to diseases that cause, uh, I'm not denying the law, subhanahu wa ta'ala's part of, but just based on the average uh, projected, what actuaries say about how long people should live, based on these insurance actuaries, what they say, they are dying prematurely because of pre-existing conditions that cause us to be predisposed to uh, diseases or viruses like COVID-19. If you have a pre-existing condition and that pre-existing condition can be brought, through, uh, brought about through uh, hereditary or it could be just through insufficient nutritional diet and all these other things, let us break up, let us advocate for an end to these death zip codes that we find all across the nation. Brothers and sisters, the greatest dawah, the most effective dawah that I've seen in my almost 50 years of practicing Islam the most effective dawah comes during times, of some of the most intense times, some of the most demanding times, some of the times when people, like in the moment that we're living in today, are looking for, they're asking for change, they're demanding change in the society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us Islam, not just as a, something that we, can hide and keep to ourselves. It's something that we are obligated to share with others. And we're not just obligated to share with those who are living uh, in our immediate neighborhoods or those who are working with us on the same jobs, but it's our responsibility to specifically and directly reach out to all segments of the society, not disregarding those who are suffering in these deaf zip codes and who are suffering from so many of the negative consequences of structural systemic racism in this country, who are suffering from the, ne the neglect that we as Muslims have not been sensitive to the needs of our hungry neighbors. When we, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was talking about neighbors, it's not limited to next door. Our neighbors in this uh, social media environment in which we live, our neighbors in this uh, immediate 24 hour news cycle and all of the information available to us, our neighbors or anyone that we know about their condition. This is how I'm defining neighbors in the times in which we live. So it's forbidden for us 
by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu if we believe to go to bed with a full stomach, knowing that our neighbors are, uh, are starving. They're part of that 41 million plus people who are going to bed near starving and their families every day of their lives, the men, women, and children. This is forbidden for us to be so comfortable in the risk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that we fail to recognize and to seek out to help, not just in feeding and in housing, but as I have said before, in advocating on behalf of those who are outside of the social margins in this country. Brothers and sisters, I pray that if there's anything that I've said that contains an iota of truth, I recognize that this comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the inspiration and guidance of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If there's anything that I've said that is against the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I claim all of those mistakes. All of those mistakes are mine. There's no deficiency in Islam. It's just deficiency in persons like myself, the practitioners of Islam, who out of our sincerity love Islam, but we are prone, we are apt uh, to make mistakes, which I readily acknowledge and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness for mistakes that I make unknowingly because I want to be a part of those who are sincere and make a mistake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me, forgive us for the mistakes that we make out of sincerity and not just out of disregard for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have prescribed for us to do. So starting today, starting at this moment, if you have not actively engaged in any kind of way, if you haven't tried to educate yourself by watching webinars, and that seems to be the going thing right now, by watching webinars or, or reading books, uh, many of us are basically bound to the houses. So uh, on one hand, it's been a wonderful experience for me. I get my favorite pastime. Uh, but because of other responsibilities, I still can't read as much as I would like to do. So educate ourselves. Contact ICNA Council for Social Justice. Uh, we are working in collaboration with uh, another division of, of ICNA uh, with Embrace in a joint campaign to uh, raise high, and this is the, uh, what I'll say in closing, to raise high the case of Imam Jamil Abdullah Al-Amin, who's been unlawfully, not unlawfully, but he's been unjustly in prison for the last 19 years uh, for a crime that I believe in the bottom of my heart did not commit. Uh, his son, Kyrie Al-Amin, made a very profound point on a webinar talking about his dad the other day when he said that Imam Jamil Abdullah Al-Amin is the George Floyd to the Muslim community right now, that we as Muslims should rally and support the cause of Imam Jamil Abdullah El Amin, uh, even if we haven't done it in the past. The, he is our George Floyd as Muslims. And so at the end of this, I ask uh, uh, that you try to benefit from anything that is good that I said and just disregard the rest. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.